Okay, so Daniel chapter 7. Um, my uh, one son, his name is Daniel. And uh, my other son, this is like, oh, Dad, you're going to be in Daniel? This is like one of my favorite sermons. So the son named Daniel's not with us, but the one who likes this sermon, he is with us. And this is a sermon that has some interesting animals in it. Uh, so there's a couple of visuals in the presentation as we'll work through this passage. But Daniel chapter 7 has these uh, huge beasts. And it actually corresponds uh, with Palm Sunday a little bit. And even the scripture reading that we had this morning, uh, well, the John 19 scripture reading. It's interesting, Jesus' statement to Pilate when he's brought before Pilate. It corresponds quite nicely with Daniel 7. If you could just follow along in your copy of God's Word, I want to read through the entire text. So let's read Daniel 7 together. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5, And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, a dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in, the, in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fire stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the, th which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts which had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Okay, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. 
Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns which were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Verse 21. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth, or the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word, that we can exalt you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Lord Jesus, and we look forward to your return when the kingdom is given into your hand. Lord, thank you for walking in humility and providing an example to us, not seizing the kingdom at the wrong time, but waiting for the Ancient of Days, the Father, to give it to you. We eagerly anticipate that day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I sought to read the text and highlight the verb given. It's, it appears seven or eight times in this text. It's not always translated was given, but it's a passive verb, was given. We saw it in John 19, from the mouth of Jesus. Should we read it again real quick? In John 19 and verse 11, Jesus answers Pilate, Pilate, and he says, you could have no power at all against me unless... It had been given. You before are from above. Who put Pilate in that position of authority? A sovereign God. A sovereign God put Pilate in that position of authority. The sovereignty of God and how he is in control over all is the theme, I would say the theme, of the book of Daniel. God is exalted. Who looks like he's in control in the book of Daniel? Not God. God looks like he's just a menial deity that had his city destroyed, his people put into captivity. But throughout the book of Daniel, God is exalted, the God of Israel. And Daniel chapter 7 places God on the throne. He is the sovereign God, the Lord over not just Israel, but the Lord of all. And that is the theme of the sermon this morning. The Lord is sovereign over the kingdoms of earth. We see that in these verbs. As people vie for authority as men, wicked men, punish others and seize authority, they might look like they're the ones in power, that they are the ones in control, but they are not. The Lord is the sovereign God, and he has given them authority. And this is a source of comfort as we think through our lives in this world and the powers that vie for power and, and strength and authority. And as we seek to 
not fear them. But so much of our hearts and our desires want to please them, to live at peace. Their authority, their power, where does it come from? It comes from God. But they are wicked men. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> he was not a good guy. In fact, king after king was a wicked king. How can a sovereign God use these wicked individuals for his own purposes? But furthermore, the most wicked ruler of all has yet to even come. But what is he but another pawn in the hands of an almighty God? The Lord is sovereign over the kings of the earth. And we're going to develop that theme this morning in 20-ish, 25 minutes or so. And we're going to see that through his four gifts. Now, they're not real gifts, but I'm trying to build off of this idea of things being given. A sovereign God in control through these four gifts. The first gift is the Lord gives dominion to kings. He gives that dominion to kings. And we see that here in verses 1 through 8. In this vision that Daniel has, in verses particularly 2 through 8, we have these beasts. And people have studied these beasts. In fact, Daniel asks for an explanation of these beasts. And I bet he was able to figure out particularly this first one. The first beast is this lion with wings. The lion with wings. Verse 2, I'm going to read it again. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my visions by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea. And we ask ourselves, well, what are these beasts? Well, fortunately, if we keep reading, the Bible tells us the beasts are kings. Look at what it says in verse 17. Those great beasts, which are four, are four Kings, And then later on in verse 23, they're going to tell us that the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. You see, the Bible in the Old Testament, particularly even in the New Testament, it doesn't make a distinction between a king and a kingdom. Because what is the kingdom? It's a king. Okay, we don't, we got to get our minds out of this de democracy idea that we have in America. If you are before the king, you're before the kingdom. He is the kingdom. He represents the kingdom. And as far as Babylon is concerned, who is the king? Nebuchadnezzar. And thus, he is also the kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar was a, a violent man, a conquering man. And he was known for the quickness, which is represented by the wings and uh, the lion was the symbol of ancient Babylon. <clears throat> we see these two symbols, both in Jeremiah and Lamentation. But in verse 4, it states that a man's heart, and the verb there, was given to the beast. Quite likely, a, uh, an allusion to Nebuchadnezzar's humility. As he lifted himself up in pride, and he says, Look at this great Babylon that... I have built. Think through Daniel 7 in light of that statement. Did he build that great Babylon? It was given to him. And God's like, you know what? I think you need to learn something here. Pop. Yeah. There it goes. It's gone. It's now given to somebody else. Do you see that? Your governing authorities, your mayor, your governor, your, the president of the United States, however they come into power, are given. And they're placed there by a sovereign God who is in control overall. And he will use those individuals for his own glory. And that is a source of comfort for the believer. They were given. So we have the first king, or the first beast, which is the first king. That's Nebuchadnezzar. The second is the Medo-Persian Empire. It states that it has three ribs in its mouth. That is probably an allusion to three conquests. Big battles that the Medo-Persian army had. The conquest of Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. The Medo-Persian army, that would be the bear. The third beast is the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great, known as a swift, very swift conqueror, hence the leopard and the wings. 
and dominion was given to him. It states that in verse 6. The empire was divided into four kingdoms, hence the four heads. So you have the one beast conquering through the four heads, the division. And then you have the last beast, which this artist, as they, they drew it, they, they sought to depict this monster through the form of a dragon. We have to understand that this is an artist trying to depict something. The text is true, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's remember that the Bible is actually true. There's some problems with the drawing, but it still kind of helps us a little bit to visualize how nasty this beast is. It is a terrible beast. Look at the description of it there in verse seven. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. Think about the comprehensive nature of the destruction of this beast. It eats, it devours, it crushes, and anything that's left, what does it do? It just stamps it all out. So there's like nothing left. This is a ferocious beast, and it terrorizes Daniel. He does not like this beast. Then in verse 8, it states, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And this is where an artist's rendition can get a little bit off. Because how many horns are there? Ten. And then what happens? What happens to the horns? You lose how many? Three, and they are supplanted by one. So how many horns are there at the end? Okay, we can do our math. 10 minus three is seven. Add one, we're up to eight. Hey, there we go, all right? So there's eight horns once that one comes up. So you have like the 10 horned, and then you have the eight horned, and the eight horned. What's the description of the eight horn? How is it identified? Is it big or small? Big. It's small. It's called a little horn. That's the tricky part. And that's where the artist gets it wrong. <laughs> it's a little horn, but it speaks big words. So we're going to develop that horn a little bit more because Daniel does later on. He inquires of it. It intrigues him. He's interested about it. And he asks questions of it later on in verses 15 and following. But first, as we continue through our four gifts, we get to the second gift. And the second gift is that the Lord gives dominion to the king. And in the vision, we see that in verses 9 through 14. And this is a big thing, okay? In Jesus' day, when Jesus, came, when Jesus came here to this earth the first time, dominion was given to whom? I said in John 19, Pilate. At least Judea was given to Pilate. Who gives the kingdom to Jesus? God the Father does. This theme is developed throughout the Old Testament. Psalm 2, it's a great text. It talks about Jesus waiting for the kingdom to be given to him. Who's in control and sovereign over all? The Lord is. God the Father. And he will give the kingdom to Jesus one day. And this text describes when that happens. So we see here in verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Look at this vision of the Ancient of Days. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. Man, just try to visualize that. And this is a fun thing, okay? Even for young people. Think about that vision. And this is why sometimes I don't like visuals. <clears throat> there are visuals of this. I did not give you them. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> God could have given us a picture book. He didn't give us that. You ever think about that? What did he give us? Words. And what does he want you to do with those words? Think. And you get to think about it. And there's value to that where you recreate that image in your mind, particularly something as sovereign as the Ancient of Days. I don't really want to depict that for you. I want you just to think about it. There's something to knowing God, even as Pastor Woodford was saying earlier, in how 
You know, there's no physical manifestation of God. People wanted, you know, the, the ancient cultures of, G, of the Israelites' day. They worshipped idols. Well, where is your God? Can't I see him? And the answer was, no. There is no physical manifestation of God. Think about that. God wants you to think. He wants you to understand him from a word perspective. And that's even when God incarnate became a man. How was he identified in John chapter 1? He was known as the word. Study these words and just think about this vision. His hair, the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. It's wheels. So the throne is on wheels. Do we see that? <laughs> a burning fiery wheels underneath it. And then a fiery stream is issuing out and came forth from before him. And then, look at the numbers here. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Oh, I wonder how many that is. Oh, what's the next line say? 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. I think the point is that they're not countable, right? <laughs> we, don't, we can't count how many people are there. There's a ton of people there that are ministering before him. These angelic beings ministering before the Ancient of Days. Then what does it state? The court. Oh, we have a judicial setting, a judge. The court was seated and the books were opened. We're familiar with books, aren't we? In the New Testament, it talks about a book, the book of life, a book where you want to have your name inscribed. You do not want to be judged by the books. You want to be noted in the book. If your name is noted in the book, then you won't be judged by the books. And if you have a question about that and you're not sure if your name is in the book, talk to Pastor Woodford. He would love to talk to you about how you can know for sure that your name is written in the book of life. So then you are not judged by the books like these books. So it states here that the court was seated and the books were opened. In verse 11, we continue. I watched then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given, there's our verb, given to the burning flame. Understand that the kingdoms of this world, they come, they rise, they fall. And one day there will be such a ferocious kingdom that will exist here on earth, it will look unstoppable. But what happens to that kingdom? It is sent to the fire. God will judge it. Do we see that? Judgment will be given. This is a court setting. And the king of kings will come and set up his kingdom. So the Lord gives dominion to the king. And the beast is given to the burning flame. Let's continue in verse 12. As for the rest of the beasts, they held, had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And the word there for prolonged is our verb given. They were given for a season or, and a time. So now verse 13, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Isn't this an amazing vision? This is Jesus, the Messiah coming before God, the father. And then verse 14, then to him was given dominion. This is God saying, it is your time to rule. Isn't that just fascinating to think through with like the temptation of Jesus where Satan says, hey, you could be king now. And Jesus says, it's not time. And furthermore, what is Satan seeking to do? Give the kingdom to Jesus. <laughs> Satan doesn't give. God the Father gives. And Jesus waited until God the Father is going to give him the kingdom. And he did. 
To do that, he had to go through suffering. This, so verse 14, To him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Believer, as you think through this world and the rising and falling of kings and authorities and powers, maybe it's even an authority in your life like a boss or something, do not fear them. We need to fear only the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who gives the power and gives the authority to these individuals. Fear the Lord. Do not fear these powers. Respect them. Do not fear them. Fear the Lord. So the Lord gives dominion to the king, and then the Lord gives justice to the saints. We already alluded to this back in verses, verses 10 and 11, where the court was seated. But we're going to continue that theme into this next section, where the Lord gives justice to the saints. In verse 15, we, we have this vision that continues, and Daniel wants an explanation. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the ter interpretation of these things. You know, it's good to ask questions, right? Aren't you guys glad that Daniel asked some questions? Kind of helps us out a lot. <laughs> Here is what, he's, what the explanation is here in verse 17. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Now that right there is a summary of everything that's going to happen for, to ver, for, for verses 19 all the way to the end. You know, that's like, okay, this is what's going to happen. The dominion that's going to come to the saints. But this is also interesting because it said earlier that the dominion was given to whom? The Son of Man. But now the dominion is given to the saints. And I just want to highlight really quickly here, a saint is a holy one. And that's what we should each be striving for, that we would seek to be holy and blameless before our God. We pursue that now. And those who are the saints will inherit the kingdom with Jesus the Messiah. That's what this is teaching. Jesus the Messiah, the Son of Man, from verses 13 and 14, he is given the kingdom, and then eventually it's going to be given also to the saints. But first, the justice. Verse 19, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns which were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. We learn about this little displacing horn in other places in the scriptures. In the New Testament, in Thessalonians, it talks about how he is the man of sin. In Isaiah 13 and 14, he is known as the king of Babylon. And in Revelation, he is identified as the Antichrist. And I thought this rend author's rendition was quite robust and quite fun, except he made the horn too large because it's supposed to be a little horn, not a big horn. And it's bigger than all of the rest. But that his horn is small probably means that he does not have great dominion, but he has the voice and everybody else seems to be doing what he says. The saints are given into his hand. We need to not miss that point. That's one of the things in verse 21. Let's keep reading the text. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. That's wrong. It's not supposed to work that way. Lord, I thought you were the one that's sovereign and in control over all. Why are you allowing the little horn who hates you to rule and have dominion over your saints? So many times we ask God, why, Lord? 
And the answer is, we cannot understand the plans of the Lord. His ways are not our ways. They are above us. But we can rest knowing that he is in control. He is sovereign over all. And even wicked powers and authorities that take control, they are in control at the by the hand of an almighty God. He is sovereign even in these situations. So we see this in verse 22. Until the ancients of days came, a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. The verb there, was made, is our given verb. A judgment was given in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the kingdom came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Now the text kind of circles back and forth to between these different themes. Now in verse 23, it comes back to the fourth beast. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour, what does it say? The whole earth. Do we understand that? It's completely comprehensive. It's over the whole world. Trample it and break it in pieces. It will be a time of great destruction. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So this kingdom will start as a beast, okay, of ten kings with these ten horns, but then one horn will displace the three, and so it will become a kingdom of eight. A kingdom of eight. The ten horns are ten kings who all shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first and shall subdue three kings. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Oh, there it is. He will persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times. And then here it is. Then the saints, what's the verb? Will be given. A sovereign God allows that to happen. The saints of the Most High will be given into his hand but only for a season. Look at the time. For a time, times, and half a time. For three and a half years. For three and a half years, it will look like God is out of control. He has no power. He has no authority. Nobody can stop the beast. Nobody can stop the little horn. Even the holy ones who do follow God Almighty, the true God, are given into the hand of the little, the little horn. He will have dominion, power, and authority. But his time will only last so long. And at the end of that time, the Lord gives justice to the saints. And he will then set up his kingdom and give his kingdom, give the kingdom to the saints. And this is our fourth and final point, our fourth and final gift. The Lord gives the kingdom to the saints. And we've seen this in verse 18, verse 22, and then finally in verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven, there's our verb, will be given. To the Son of Man? No. It's given to the Son of Man back in verse 14. Yes. But as ones who are with the Son of Man, ones who are in Jesus the Messiah, they are, it is given to the saints shall be given, what does it say? To the people, the saints of the Most High. Believer, as you go through this life, I don't know what trials or situations, troubles or travails that God in His sovereignty has allowed into your life. This is the mystery, you know? This God that we just read about, He is transcendent. He is high. He is above. He is over all. He has supreme and complete power. Do you believe that? I hope you do. And as you think through that this is the God who is over all, think through too. <gasps> I can trust him. He's a personal God. He loves me. And he sent his son to a cross for me. God is transcendent and he is high and above all. But at the same time, he is personal and he loves you. 
and he will help you and guide you and direct you through whatever problem, whatever situation you encounter. Those who believe in Jesus, according to New Testament and other passages it reveals, will not have to go through this time of great struggle, of great trial, when the saints of the Most High are even given into the hand of this wicked ruler. I pray that you would, if you haven't already, trusted in Jesus as your own personal Savior. Jesus states, my yoke is light. It is a good life to follow Jesus, our Savior. It is an easy life. It is a life of belief. It is a life of trust. As you go through life and the problems and trials will still come, but the God who is sovereign over all will help you through them. I pray that you have worshiped the Lord this morning through Daniel chapter 7. Let's close in prayer. Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We look forward to the day when Jesus the Messiah returns and sets up his kingdom here on earth. Lord, we thank you for the promise that those who, um, those who trust in him, those who believe in the Lord Jesus, will rule and reign with him here on this earth. Lord, I pray for those who are here that they would continue to live and seek to live holy lives before you. And Lord, if there are any here who have not trusted in you in their, as their personal Savior, that they would reach out to Pastor Woodford or one of the deacons and know how the God who is over all wants to have a personal relationship with them. Lord, we, we exalt you and worship you this morning, the God who is sovereign over all. In Jesus' name, amen.